Heather, very much. Um, some of the information you said was actually true. So, um, it's really great to be here, and uh, it's great to be back in Massachusetts. So I'm going to um, I'm going to begin my talk in a very strange place. This is a uh, clip from a movie called Freaks from 1932. So you may it's a classic. This is annoying. On the bearded lady's baby's born. Uh, that's that screenplay at its best. But uh, the reason why I'm, I'm putting this out, this is Johnny Ack. He had a condition known as Amelia. And Amelia is, was a, it, it's a, you know, it's a, not an uncommon uh, environmental anomaly, but I put him out because uh, just how beautifully he walks and how uh, I can see other clips of him. He's quite athletic. And uh, he is uh, typical of people with this condition in terms of how they move around and how, how agile they are. This is Faith. Uh, Faith is from Oklahoma City. She was born with her two forelimbs. And um, she uh, spontaneously, like many animals who have this condition, uh, she uh, spontaneously developed this ability to walk upright. Now, this is not just a circus, circus trick. You know, but she has a curved spine, has shifted her center of mass forward. Uh, she has, in effect, grown into her developmental anomaly. And if you think about it, she's accomplished in one lifetime that just ought to be for the crowning in human evolution. This is my favorite recent example. You may have seen in Duncan. Duncan is a, a rare anomaly where the two hind limbs have been uh, maldeveloped. But look how amazing this animal is able to walk and run. And then, not all things are done by. I say so, so short because I, I, on Sunday I was so I, I was so upset. I thought I was going to be walking to the audience, you know. <laughs> so I threw that in for you. Just remember how how great things can come. Moment. Uh, 
So congratulations <laughs> for those of you who care. Okay, so, um, so the, basic, the reason why I show these clips is that I want to make a fundamental point here, which is that each of us has to figure out how to move the body that we have. And we must develop a nervous system that is functionally integrated with the body. Whether our body, our typical or eight is govern our development. So I always think it's important to point out that genetic activity is way down here, buried inside of a cellular membrane. And somehow that genetic activity will have a relationship behavior to behavior, but genes are not the only thing that matter. We also have physical influences. We have uh, sensory stimulation. And it's also important to point out that behavior feeds back and provides one of the sources of sensory stimulation to a developing animal. The area that I'm going to focus on in the talk is in this region in here, where sensory stimulation and behavior interact with pattern neural activity and neural activity, the kind of integrated uh, outcomes that those clips were meant to What does any of this have to do with sleep? That's the subject of my talk. So to give you a preview, I'm going to argue that it does not I'm going to show you that sleep is not an absence of behavior. The here is in behavior. And for somebody who studies sleep, sometimes people say, well, you're in behavior. Yeah, I am. I really am. Really, I'll show you. Not twitching, which is the behavior I'll be focusing on, is among the most prominent behaviors of early infancy. And sensory feedback from twitching limbs is a primary activator of neural circuits throughout the developing brain. I will argue that twitches comprise a unique class of self-generated behavior, and that twitching may be a critical missing factor for our understanding of various neurodevelopmental disorders, including things like autism. First, this is a great great dog doing what she did best, which was doing this. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people look at behaviors and they think immediately, you know, rabbits, uh, dogs chasing rabbits in their dreams. And sometimes it can even look like that. Um, and she did a lot, you can even see sometimes of the, the facial uh, musculature as well. This is a human uh, exhibiting what she we know very little about twitching in humans, which is one reason why I'm going to be moving into the human domain in some of my future work. But you can see the fine movements of the twitch, uh, twitches of the limbs, the ankles, the, the elbows, the fingers. Um, this I got off of YouTube is the best source for this information. This was a guy I a video of uh, his, uh, his girlfriend's uh, toes. They are lovely. What I want to point out is that this abduction of the pinky toe, so you can see that a lot Space of switching is space of exploring places that people are able to do this spontaneously, but I, I think that's amazing thinking uh, during that. Um, what, you, what you may not think about, about twitching is that rapid eye movements gives REM sleep its name. It is twitch, they are twitches of extraocular muscles. And uh, this is a really lovely film showing just how active these, uh, these muscles can be. So, you know, again, people think about these as these watching your dreams, the scanning high. Of, of, of REM sleep, but, uh, really, in my opinion, just twitches of extraocular muscles and then, uh, ferrets. And um, ferrets are also amazing. They twitch throughout their life and, and they do quite a bit. You can see twitches of the whiskers of the face, the, the fingers, and the lungs. So what is all this about? There's an old folk psychological twitching that goes back to India. It's by George Romani, who was one of George Darwin's hand-picked successors, and George said, Moving their noses and doing it well, as if pursuit of rabbits and the, and the model is quite easy. You dream and you chase rabbits. So that the, the chasing of the rabbits is really just a very simple extension of what the dream work is doing, presumably in the cortex, some sort of cortex activation of the theory would go uh, these movements. We've gotten a little bit more sophisticated over the years. So we, we know that REM sleep is uh, uh, predominantly influenced by brainstem neural circuits. And so the idea is that the brainstem activates the cerebral cortex, other areas of the forebrain. You have a dream, that dream leads to some activation that flows out. And the medulla, an area, the midline of the medulla, blocks that motor outflow from that dreaming cortex that prevents you from, as this theory would, would insist, if you don't have this area, and I should say, is, is an imperfect filter of having this dream work to make its way through this through this filter. Now, if we do a, say, a lesion of this area, that's a lesion, uh, then you are going to be back to ch chasing rabbits. This is uh, the prevailing view of what happens 
phenomenon known as REM behavior disorder. Disorder, you'll see that there are twitches. And then what happens in behavior due to a various uh, losses of certain neural circuits is that these, these twitches can get very violent and people can fall out. They can, in some cases, people have argued it murder your spouse. Uh, you'll probably see it more and more being used as a, as a, as a as excuse, an excuse, but as a, as a, what do you call it? Thank you. A uh, defense for you know, killing your spouse. Can we be sure that dreams are the causes of movements, not the other way around? The answer is we don't know yet, and this is sort of an ongoing debate. But regardless of that debate, the notion that the forebrain is later of twitches is wrong. Here's uh, uh, a sagittal section through, uh, uh, let's call it a rat, and uh, let's say that this rat chases rabbits. We know that they don't. This is where the chasing rabbit streams are happening. If we put a precolicular decelebration, in my favorite tool, <laughs> through, uh, through the brain, you simply segregate this entire area of the brain from this entire brain stem. You still get sleep wake cycling, more importantly, you still get normal rates of twitching. You have no effect on the ability of these animals to twitch. In fact, you can't tell the difference in twitches in young animals uh, when uh, you put pre separation now. So we know that twitches are not the place where. Uh, at the brain, the forebrain rather is not where 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 the twitches occur. We we know really now is that there are there is in parallel activation of the cortex and other parts of the forebrain at the same time as the twitching is occurring. Okay, so you have activity going rostrally, bodily, but now that gets at the idea that if the twitches are not mere byproducts of a dreamy forebrain, then what could they be? To answer this question, and I have chosen to focus on infants for one very, very simple reason, and because that's where the light is, right? So, a famous uh, image of a, of a paper from 1966 now, where we're looking at sleep across the lifespan. This has been you know, corroborated over and over and over again. But basically, um, when we're born, we spend about 16 hours of each day asleep, eight hours of which are spent in REM sleep, eight hours are in non-REM or slow wave sleep. Eight hours before we're awake. So when we're born, we're spending a good chunk of our time in our sleep, and it is One of the ideas people have is that's when you're developing the fastest. That's when rest sleep is most important for early developmental processes. Uh, a lot, they also twitch a lot. Now, this is a human infant, and uh, I'm going to show you the, this infant. This is again off YouTube, again, the best resource for all things. Sleeping. Um, this infant is twitching at three times normal speed because it turns out that human infants are a lot more interesting at three times normal speed than they are at normal speed. And you can see a lot of uh, uh, movements uh, here. This, this baby in particular has a lot of ankle and knee twitches and a lot of twitches of the contralateral. Uh, shoulder and elbow. And what you're going to see here is <clears throat> something that you see very often, and we see this in our rats. It's, just, it's happening a little bit faster at this at this speed. But the baby is going to wake up, and I just want to show you what it looks like for a human infant to, or any infant really, to be asleep. The baby is very relaxed. You're seeing these twitches against this background of relaxation, and there's going to be sudden arousal. Here it comes, and there's going to be stretching and kicking and high amplitude movements, highly coordinated. Increase in muscle tone, there's probably a lot of crying going on, and then some relaxation, you're going to see twitches resuming very quickly right there. That is what, that's what the sleep cycle looks like. And what changes across development is not really how the stuff is structured in time, it's that you basically, you're just expanding the temporal scale. That's really one of the major changes that you see across early sleep. You also see twitches in the face. This is a former graduate student of mine looking at with her, with her son. And this it's, it's, it's interesting, but um, a lot of people see smiles, smirks, and all kinds of things. That's you interpreting, I think, what the baby is doing. Um, but you can see that that was a smirk. And if you could see it at three times normal speed, you can see how ballistic these motions are and how much is going on. You can see the rapid eye movements happening under the limb. The lids, that's how we know that the baby is in REM sleep. Um, you can see for, you know, the, 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 the brow is, is twitching as well. So this is uh, very, very common. And this is what 
of what sleep looks like in a, in a newborn rat. This is normal speed. And uh, the, uh, they here, if you look closely enough, um, often been confused with seizure activity uh, um, because for obvious reasons. And if you Google uh, twitching and babies, you'll find lots of parents asking people, does my child have epilepsy? It's a common concern among parents. Now, rat pups spend about 70% of their time asleep, and twitching occurs exclusively against a background of muscle atonia. I'll explain that in a little bit. It's just, it's, it's active suppression of, the, of muscle tone. Every cell in a muscle that we've looked at twitches during sleep, and there are probably millions of twitches occurring every single day in an infant rat's life through the first, at least, po first postnatal week. That's a lot of byproduct uh, for a developing nervous system. Now these and other findings have convinced us that twitches are, are a fine feature of active sleep and that they represent a distinct class of movement. And what I want to twitches look like when we are muscle tone and how it relates to behavior. When you have a high muscle tone, this we're just measuring the muscle in the neck. So this is a good postural muscle. The and maybe doing a little bit of high amplitude movements like that. And begin. You can see these twitches against this background of low tone. So this defines the period of sleep when there's a very rapid arousal to high muscle tone again. Notice the time scale of two seconds. This is a 20 second uh, period basically defining the sleep cycle. Now, EMGs provide a somewhat anemic view of the ratio temporal organization of twitching. And our argument was that if twitching is a behavior, you should study it like a behavior. Now, most uh, uh, studies of, of development and in, in, in in young motor development in young humans, young animals, looks at wake behavior. <clears throat> but if sleep, if twitches actually are a behavior, they are worthy of studying as a behavior. And so we, to do this, uh, we use a high-speed video and 3D motion tracking uh, to understand the kinematics of movements in these, in these limbs. It's never been before. We wanted to know what was happening at millisecond time scale to figure out what these movements were about. And so we applied um, a very high-tech um, grocery store um, ultraviolet sensitive uh, fingernail paint uh, to, uh, to very strategic locations of the body. And we use two high speed, uh, high definition uh, video cameras. These are black lights. For those of you who grew up in the 60s, you know exactly what those are. And, um, and the pup is here down below being lit up uh, by the lights and being filmed uh, for 3D uh, subsequent analysis. Now, this is what a twitch, a twitch looks like. In and what I really want to highlight here, this is just an abduction of the shoulder. What I want to hold, highlight here is, and it's not a loop, so you're seeing the same thing over and over again, but how discreet the movement is. Look at it with just your nervous system. It looks like it's popcorn. It looks like it's highly you know, random, and it's just like a spastic kind of contraction of lots of muscles of the body. But these are very small muscles, twitching very, very quickly, and these are very discreet movements. Now we can Take these, uh, oh, and then what I also want to show is that sometimes you get complex sequences of movements, and so I want you to focus on this right forearm here. Notice that you're going to see shoulder, elbow, wrist in sequence. Um, shoulder, elbow, wrist. And we see lots and lots of examples of very rapid sequential movements of multiple joints, okay, which we think is significant, which we've actually shown is that it's significant. Now we can take each one of these ticks here is a different twitch. We have left versus the right forelimb, shoulder, elbow, wrist, whether it's a flexion or extension, abduction, adduction. So we have 12 different groupings of twitches here occurring over time. What you immediately see is that it doesn't look like a random distribution of twitches. You have periods of high density clustering and then some silence. And sometimes one limb is not twitching and the other one is. OK, so from a distance, it looks like there's some organization. And if we blow this up, let's just say this period right here, and we look down across a three second interval. Now you see a different sort of organization. You see, again, like this clustering, silence, clustering, silence. There seems to be sort of a bath within bath structure. And we can go even further and blow up this region right here and look at 160 milliseconds. And now you see a, a little group here, another group here, group here, group here. And we saw it over and over again. And we, you know, to make a long story short, we did a lot of analysis, analysis of this. We showed that there is a structure, a lot of statistically significant structure, and that it changes over the first post postnatal week, which is the, the, the age range we're looking at. So it's developing, like you would expect of any given behavior. So twitches have a, a surprising ratio temporal structure that changes with age. 
Um, and I've already mentioned, twitches uh, represent a distinct class of movement. And so they Well, we think that twitching may be a critical contributor to the process whereby our brain learns about the developing body. So this is where I'm going to start to develop the idea. Twitching is not just a product, it's structure that can develop as a behavior. It's actually contributing to the self-organization of the nervous system. To where we're going with this, and it's the, the notion of discrete twitch is very, very important here. Consider this cartoon sitting on a bank of switches, and those bank, that bank of switches is connected in some unknown way to a bank of lights. And the question is, if you wanted to know the relationship between the bank of switches and the bank of lights, how would you solve that problem? And really the answer is pretty obvious. I think what you would do spontaneously is you, you would push the switch in sequence, discreetly, see the effect, and adjust for the consequences. Now, if you imagine that this switch is a, if the motor neuron pulls, it's and these muscle fibers, these could be, uh, these could be cortical motor neurons, these could be, you know, uh, you know, red nucleus motor. It doesn't matter which level of the nervous system you're talking about because you have topographic relationships that are working their way. Maps within maps within maps. Of all of that. So an extension of this idea is, well, why twitch against the background of low muscle tone? Well, for a very simple reason. It's like turning off the lights. You have now increased your signal to noise ratio. So now the signal that you're getting from the muscle or from the twitch is exacerbated against this background of low noise. And if any of you have ever watched any submarine movie, you know what, what, what happens in the movie. If you know, remember Hunt for Red October, right? One ping only. Remember that part of the movie, if you've seen it? So everybody in the submarine has to get really dead quiet. Why? Because you need to decrease the, the floor of the noise. So that when you send out that sonar signal, you're getting a very good discrete signal back that you can then interpret. It's also not to alert the enemy that enemy that you're there, but that's another. It's really there for the sonar. So now we have these movements, these lights coming on. It's very quite clear how they move, and so that's what we think is happening in the nervous system. You're you're creating a very good no, noise floor against which now twitches are a very good signal, They're not going to be corrupted by other motions. And if you think about it. Waking is a very high noise situation. The wake movements, all the movements I'm making right now, is a, I have a very highly noisy nervous system. Okay, but <clears throat> for any of this to make any sense, uh, we have to have some to answer a very basic question, is, which is, does the nervous system pay attention to the twitch? Now, if you think about that, you will, you will also probably, if you, have, if you know anything about sleep, you probably sleep of of separation from the environment, of turning off the environment, of creating a situation where you have your own internal situation, paying attention to the outside. That's what we think about sleep, divorcing ourselves from uh, the external world. But, I mean, 10 years ago, Yuri Bisaki and his uh, colleagues showed um, that there are these phenomena called single bursts that can be detected very early on uh, in development. In the first postnatal week, you're already Perfectly organized uh, oscillatory events, which can be related to areas of sensory motor cortex on the surface of the fat brain. So number one here is the forelimb region of the of, 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 of that somatosensory cortex, and five is the hindlimb region. Peripheral motor activity during sleep and during wake, as it turned out. That turned out to be, I think, a somewhat confusing situation. We can talk about that later. And this was phenomenally revolutionary because at that time, there were thought to be no interesting oscillatory or any kind of event in the cerebral cortex of a young developing infant rat until about, the day of, until about 11 days of age, when you first start to see delta activity or slow wave activity in the cerebral cortex. So it showed two things. One, that the cortex is already active in an interesting way. And second, it already has some topographic organization. So now let me show you what, it, after you know, some years of working on this, probably let's just map out what, is, what a twitch is doing and what we, what we think it's conveying to the nervous system. We begin with a brain stem activation uh, of the spinal cord, which leads to muscle activation and the twitch, which can involve movement of the limb in space. It could involve touching of the limb against a uh, surface. 
You're going to have tactile and proprioceptive feedback from that movement, from the contact. It's going to make its way back to the, the basic, you know, sensory systems of the, of the somatosensory system, the spinal cord, the dorsal column nuclei, the thalamus, and the primary somatosensory cortex. We've shown at very early ages, it's already communicating with the other side of the cortex um, through, the, uh, through the corpus callosum. And then we have also shown that there's hippocampal activation. So let me show you an example of the hippocampal cortical connection. So what I'm going to show you is a record. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, activity in the in, in primary somatosensory cortex, the forelimb region, and the hippocampal unit. There are twitches, individual twitches uh, of in the periphery. And, and you can see a burst of cortical activity followed by bursts of hippocampal unit activity. And it's extremely regular. Okay? And what we showed also was that if we, do, if we cut off the cortex from the hippocampus, we still got the, the, the cortical activation, but we lost the hippocampal activation, showing that the information is actually passing the cortex to the hippocampus within this period of the first postnatal week. So it suggests that there is, all, there is sort of somatotopically organized information that is being sent through as far forward as the cortex then into the hippocampus in, the, in a rather organized fashion. Region here just to say that we also need to cortex. And barrel cortex is important, and this is the part of somatosensory cortex that pays attention to the whiskers. It's highly somatotopic organized, such that the barrel themselves can be related to individual whiskers. And what we showed is that when the animals uh, showed that whiskers twitch, I'll show you the video in a second, and the feedback from those switches make their way all the way up to the barrel cortex. So here's a high-speed video a record of a newborn rat whiskers uh, twitching. And you, every time the light comes on, we're finding twitches in the body, so we know the animals have seen this is a loop. You can see just how the, uh, these, these movements occur. We saw complex twitches like this. We saw individual twitches. We saw pairwise twitches. We saw lots of different patterning, patterns of twitches. But the thing is that even this system is twitching early in development and we think is playing a role in, in refining, helping to organize and refine this very important system for them. Now let me show you what the record looks like uh, electrographically. Again, we have the EMG activity. This is open unit. Multiple activity in that system. Here's an animal that's asleep. Here's an animal that's awake. Are in active sleep. Notice this. When the animal wakes up, the activity goes away. But the animal is moving. The whiskers are moving during this period, and we're not seeing any activity here. I'll come back to that in a second. Here's basically the overall inactivity. Here's the animal, the, the burst per minute of thalamic activity when the animal's in active sleep, and here is the activity level when they are awake. This bugged us to no end because this is the very opposite of what I thought was supposed to happen. When we're awake, we have brain activity. <laughs> when we sleep, we probably have less. We still have some, but why no brain activity when these animals were awake? We were repeatedly noticing this strange pattern. It was bothering me. I would talk about it with students, but we had so many other things to do that it took about three or four years before we finally said it's time to tackle this problem. So this is what we did. Um, we happen to be studying motor cortex and if that's, don't ignore the idea that it's a motor cortex. The notion that motor cortex is just motor cortex is wrong. It's also sensory cortex, just like sensory cortex is motor cortex. These words get in the way of actually understanding what brains do. It's unfortunate, but very early in development, especially the motor cortex is purely sensory. So don't be surprised by that aspect of this. Independent activity in motor cortex, I'm calling it sensory motor cortex. The periods that are in gray are when the animal is awake. This is multi unit activity. These are the two muscles we're recording from. This is the local field potential in the cortex. Not that important for now. Just notice the unit activity. The animal's sleeping in here. The activity is very high. The animal wakes up, shuts down. Then the animal goes back to sleep, and the activity resumes. 
this is in motor cortex. So again, it's right, a couple things. A lot of Here is the amount of activity uh, in the cortex. At this point, before I continue and say how we solve this problem, I need to point out to you how we actually do what we do measuring activity in our rest. Because it took a long time to perfect these methods. We're, we're only a few groups of us that are doing it right now. Uh, we, you know, one of the major things we try to do is to, is to divine methods to allow us do in vivo neurophysiology and unanesthetized head fix in the class, allowing us to report from any part of the brain that we wish to report to. The initial response when you see this is that a lot of people is to say, oh my god, that's terrible. They're sleeping 80% of the time. They sleep more when they're head fixed than when they're, than when they're not. However, they've been in a uterus for a good chunk of their time, which is also a highly constraining environment. They don't show any sign of stress. They do not show anything about both flies. They keep them warm. They keep them humid. Doing what babies do, they sleep a lot. In fact, like I said, 80% of the time. But what we do is they, these animals are head fixed, they're kept warm, they're humid. We uh, use, uh, use depth electrodes uh, from Neuronexus or any, you know, we use a variety of different things depending on the brain we are working on. And this shows, just a side view, show that the animal is, is uh, bound here and they their limbs are freely moving and they twitch and they exhibit some weight. Now, in the next slide, I'm going to show you what this looks like when we're coming from the cortex. And we'll just go recording from a part of the cortex that's responsive. And the experiment here is simply flexing the left hind limb, and you can see this burst of multi unit activity, which is what you would expect. Now, the next slide you're going to in this video. Now, this is what normal pitching looks like. And every time the animal can you notice what happens right here, the sinus, and then the animal uh, twitches right before that activity, twitch right there, and then silence and twitches again. This is typical of what we do. <clears throat> this is what it looks like <clears throat> in slow motion. And the finest of movements can lead to a really nice, uh, robust activity pattern. This is what it looks like when they're And virtually nothing going on in court. Okay. So again, this is just this is confounding us. Uh, and we um, we simply asked, finally, through what mechanism the twitch is processed differently than what's related to movement. Now, to answer this question, I'm going to ask you a question. Why can't you control yourself? Yeah. Even if it's even forgetting about the part of the brain, what is the difference between tickling yourself and somebody tickling you? You know you're doing it.